Um, the advice I'm giving to you today should be qualified with no one really knows what's going to happen in the next couple of months um, in the job or internship market. Um, so with that being said, let me give you a little bit of the background on, on what I do and uh, the types of service we try to do with my website. So um, grew up locally in Washington, D.C. Washington, area, went away to college, came back, was involved in campaigns, um, presidential campaign, local state ex uh, county executive races, et cetera. Uh, but I landed an internship with um, then uh, minority whip Nancy Pelosi. She had just become the whip uh, five months prior. And I was on all these email lists on the Hill. And then I eventually, that internship, like many, turned into a job. And I knew all these people looking to get on the Hill. And at the time, the Democrats were in the complete minority. Um, and, but no, no White House, uh, neither body of Congress, they had any control over. So it was really hard to get a job in politics for a Democrat. So um, a lot of people that I knew were trying to get these jobs. So I started forwarding the job announcements that I would receive in my inbox as an official House employee, especially those in leadership are often on uh, multiple lists, whether it's the chief of staff mailing list, the scheduler mailing list, et cetera. And it became known that, oh, if you're looking to get a job on the Hill, just email Tom Hill, add you to his list, and he'll start forwarding job announcements. So over a 10-year period, I was doing that. Um, I met a very smart uh, young woman who became my wife, uh, who convinced me to turn it into a website, because if, after 10 years of doing it, short of 10 years doing it, um, everyone knew my name for the service I was providing. And she was also, um, she was a Republican. She worked for the Bush White House. So she pushed me to make it nonpartisan or bipartisan. So we together launched this website um, back in 2011. Um, so nine years ago. And what we do is we just seek to get every job we can see out there that would be of any interest to anyone in the policy, political, government, nonprofit realm. So it's everything, it starts with Capitol Hill jobs, that's, that was the base of it, but it gets into campaign jobs, nonprofits, private sector, uh, other government jobs, whether it be at embassies or local governments, you name it. Um, but that is a service and that's important in finding a job, but it's only really a third of it. The other two thirds is networking. And that's what hopefully I'm gonna help you try to figure out today in this new world. So networking is so key because you can, you can know of a job, but it was just, refer to Capitol Hill jobs for now. Um, Chiefs of staff tell me that in the first 24 hours, they receive two to 300 resumes. And if you, if you printed out all those, that'd be a stack of resumes this high. And your question to yourself is how do you get on that stack and not in it, not at the bottom, but on top. And that's via a recommendation. That's via someone you've gotten coffee with recommends you to that hiring manager or someone in the office. Um, it's an intern, a fellow intern, it's um, someone that was from your same hometown, that your same ethnicity, your same religion, your same college, your same uh, fraternity sorority to recommend you. Or someone you've impressed at a prior job, campaign, um, or internship. Um, so how do you get that well? of network. Um, it's all about Netflix and on Capitol Hill in this COVID world is those coffees, those informational coffees are non-existent at least for the time being and probably for a, a pretty far future. I don't know that someone's going to risk coming into work or going to a coffee shop just for an informational coffee. They're probably going to ask you to do it via Zoom or a phone call. And those are a little less personal. Um, so if you're able to do it in person at the right time without endangering anyone's health or making someone feel uncomfortable, um, definitely do that. But absent of doing it in person, making it as easy as possible for them is the key. So I'm a father of three young kids, nine, seven, and five. My wife's small business is in, is in trouble, as most are during, um, during this crisis. So I've got the kids all to myself while trying to do a full-time job in my website. So the people that have been reaching out to me, hey, can you do a call? Help me um, advise me on my job career path, the answer right, right now is no. Like this is the first thing that I've done in this realm because it is so busy for working parents because there is no school, there is no daycare. So I'm just t telling you that story to know that, to give you insight into the, the world some people are dealing with right now. Um, other people have different stresses. They have parents to take care of. They're, they've gotten sick themselves. So you need to approach and ask for an informational um, interview or Zoom with the utmost respect and the utmost deference. 
um, like you don't want to put them out too much, but you would be extremely valuable to get their time. So say you've gotten someone's time. And that's again, when you, when you try to find someone who shares that common connection with you, whether it's hometown, college, ethnicity, whatever, um, they're a little bit more likely to help you even from the very beginning of doing informational uh, discussion. So when you enter that informational discussion, there are a couple of key things you need to keep in mind. One, don't waste your time asking them about their career path when you can look it up on LinkedIn or on the internet. Two, come informed of what they've done or the career path they've taken. So your first, when we, if you were to sit down with me, your first question, and I'm not saying me specifically, but someone like me, should be, so Tom, I saw you spend around 10 years on Capitol Hill. Can you tell me a little bit how you got in, into that job? As opposed to saying, so where, where did you start your career? And have me waste three or five minutes of that coffee explaining what you could have already researched on the internet. So when you, when you're, what, you're, what your goal is to do is to try to gain information and insight into how that person got their successful start, but then also establish a, a relationship. And part of establishing a relationship is letting people talk about themselves. It's strange, it sounds weird, and I don't think it's only DC, but it's especially prominent in DC. People love talking about themselves, and they love telling you their story, uh, because they remember people doing the same thing to, to them when they were in your shoes. So when you get them to tell their story, you're gonna gain insights on, on, pat, on steps that you might be able to take. But the key of establishing this relationship is a, a few things. One, it's at the end of that conversation, you never leave it without another person to talk to. So say you, you've met them because they're from the same, same home state and you, the, the conversation has kind of gone that way. You say, you know, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, especially in these times. I know how tough it is. Um, you've given me a ton of things to think about and act upon. Would you, is there someone else you suggest I, I follow up with um, that could, they could also, they could also, I could also talk to you about finding a job? And they'll say, oh yeah, you're interested in the environment. I know someone in Earl Blumenauer's office. Oh, you're, you're interested in um, working for the administration. My uh, friend's friend is, is working in, at HUD. I'll put you in touch with her. Um, those types of things. Um, and what you're look, looking to do is create a web of people that you can lean upon to either forge your resume, recommend you, let you know of a job opening, or, or some, some mix of that. So picture yourself at the beginning of that web. Here's your hometown, the people that you've reached from, out from your hometown. Here's your Georgetown connections. Here's your ethnicity. Here's your religion. Here's your you know, previous campaign experience. And just because you reached out to someone who you worked with on a campaign doesn't mean they're not going to connect you to someone to the hometown. And that person will connect you with someone you know, with an interest in the issue that you want to do. And at the end, you're going to have this whole web of people who you're going to keep track of who they are, what you talked about in the discussion, so that you can figure out when to call upon them. And what I mean by that is when you've applied, you found out about the job on my website and say it's in, um, I don't know, Congressman Steve Scalise's office. And you go through a spreadsheet that you've kept, keeping track of all your, co your coffees or informational coffees or Zooms or whatever they are these days. And you say, okay, who of all these people I've networked with would know someone in Scalise's office? And you're combing through that and you find someone originally from Louisiana that might know someone. You might find someone on that spreadsheet that works for a Louisiana member, so chances are they're going to know someone in the Louisiana delegation. Um, or you're going to find someone that used to work for House leaders, House Republican leadership who might know folks that worked in, in there, and you're going to find them. And you're going to ask them, hey, and you, you always apply via the normal channels, so when you're applying for that staff assistant job in Steve Scalise's office, you apply. And then you, you always, when you reach out to ask that person, say, hey, I applied to this, you always say the name of the, um, the job, I've applied via the normal channels, attaches my resume, any chance you know somebody in that office you could recommend me to. And that is the key. So you're building up that network to do that multiple times for different jobs and sometimes multiple times for the same job, depending upon how it all works out and shakes out. So you have that coffee, that Zoom, that, that you get that additional person to talk to. But then how do you follow up with that initial person that you talk to? You always send them a thank you email, always, 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 with your resume attached, and I can't tell you how many times people have gotten jobs by, you know, someone sitting in a congressional office, the chief of staff comes up to them and says, hey, none of the interns are cutting it. We need someone to fill our legislative correspondent position. You know anyone looking like, oh yeah, this young woman I just had coffee with, she's a star. Like, I'll, I'll, and that job was never posted on my website. It wasn't sent on an email list. It was simply that's chief of staff coming to the people that worked in that office 
and that resume was sent and that interview is happening without it being posted anywhere. The other thing is in a non-COVID world, I would suggest always sending a thank you note. And I know it's going to be much harder these days to send a handwritten thank you note um, because you don't know addresses, you can't drop it off the office, et cetera. But if and when we're at this, um, your generation and the, and the few years before you just don't do handwritten thank you notes anymore. And I'm telling you, it'll separate you from everybody else to do a handwritten thank you note in addition to the thank you email with your resume attached. So then after you've established that relationship, you sent them your resume, you are also gonna need to keep up with these people. And I get the question all the time, how often is too often to check back in with somebody? Well, in that conversation, you're gonna learn something about them. You're gonna learn that I work for Nancy Pelosi. You're gonna learn that I'm a crazy Washington DC sports fan. So when the NHL starts back up and the Capitals win their first round of the playoffs, shoot me an email saying, hey, Tom, I saw the Caps won. Congrats on your team. By the way, I'm still looking for a job. I applied here, I hope you're well. And I, when I get that email, I'm like, oh my gosh, that guy, that guy remembered I'm a Caps fan, that's so cool. Oh yeah, I know this person, I'll send your resume, boom. So it's not only about like sports allegiances or hometowns, you're just, you're just trying to email something to keep that relationship going. And I would say every six weeks isn't too, too much and it varies person to person. But if you're emailing somebody every month or every two weeks, that's way too much. Um, but kind of like keeping it at the top of their mind every six to eight weeks is a good thing to do. Um, and just come up with the stupidest things to do. If there's ever something you could do for them um, that I'm not saying like bribe people, but I'm just saying like, if you, if you are invited to a reception and your boss is like, look, we need to pack this room, like help us get people. You open up your spreadsheet and start sending emails to all the people you've networked. You're like, hey, my boss is having a reception. I uh, want to invite you to it. And it might be like not relevant, whatever to them, but at least you're showing them that person that um, you've, you've talked to, that you have interest in their well being or you're trying to help them out, that they're more likely to help you out is the, is the bottom line. So you've built up this, this bank of resume, this bank of um, contacts. You sent them all your resume. So how do you get that job? So um, taking a part of my experience in, um, in finding a job, one of the jobs that I got, my first job after Capitol Hill, is I, I had banked up 10 years of working on the Hill, uh, and including campaign life, 11 years. So uh, the guy hiring me, the CEO of the Trade Association, he and I had a lot of people in common. So I and, I, and I'm admitting I had a wealth of contacts because of that time on the Hill. And I looked him up on, on LinkedIn and we had so many people in common. So I set a goal that for two weeks straight, I was gonna have 10, 10 days out of two weeks, I was gonna have somebody reach out to him that we both knew to recommend me. And so I was able to do that and crank that out. So in my final interview, he said, you know, I've been hearing a lot about you from a lot of people. I said, oh, hopefully not too much. And he said, no, it's never a bad thing to, to hear good things about someone you're, you're about to hire. And that kind of stuck with me, and that's key. The more people that can weigh in on your behalf, the better. The higher up they are, the more personal relationship to the hiring manager, great. The personal relationship they have to the member of Congress or whomever the CEO is of the company or running that office, the better. But even if it's you know lower, lower level too, it's someone you went to college with, someone you went to grad school with, um, and they're able to email the legislative director in that office or the communications director, and they're able to tell the chief of staff that they've heard great things about you, that can help. So peppering people with recommendations is key. Um, and then we can get into interview stuff and, like, and, and others, other questions and resumes, um, which I don't um, claim to be an expert on. But in the realm of this new world, a couple of, a couple of things. And I checked in with some friends on the Hill, <clears throat> both sides of the aisle and Democratic and Republican. And here's where we are on internships. And basically, it's they fall into three categories currently in this COVID world. One, some people are going full bore with paid digital or work at home internships. The catch with that one is that they have to ship you a House of Representatives or US Senate laptop because you can only, for security reasons, you can only do the work of the institution on with those laptops. And you know, a lot of offices are not willing to go, to, go that far to do that. Um, the good news is because of the work of many over years and years, there's now an appropriation to pay interns. So there is, most offices are paying their interns. But again, because of the complication of the technology and the inability to work at a fast pace, um, and honestly, some lack of work for interns to do because these institutions are not in as much as they were um, because of COVID, um, some offices are pushing um, summer internships 
off till July. Some are just punting till, till the fall to see what the world looks like. Um, and that's, the, that's kind of the intern. The House of Representatives sent out guidance, I think it was two weeks ago in an email, uh, the beginning of May, basically saying, you know, the, the House Administration Committee has worked out the, an ability to continue to pay interns. Here's your budget, you can pay interns. You need to use an official, um, you know, technology, that kind of thing. So it's, it's doable, it's just finding it. I know a lot of you are gonna graduate sooner, you're figuring out the internship and stuff. On the, on the entry level jobs on Capitol Hill, it's a little bit trickier because without a member of Congress being in town and in session consistently, there's stuff for, for entry level jobs to do, like re replying to constituent mail, answering the phones, but not as much. So what I'm hearing from a bunch of people is that some offices are holding off on hiring for just simply the lack of work that is being able to be spread around and without the worry of what is next and funding and all of that. So we're really unsure times right now and I wish I had more answers for you guys. I, I try to do a lot of legwork to be fully informed for this conversation. Um, but that's, that's what I've gotten is that everyone says every office is doing it differently. And what you need to keep in mind about Capitol Hill is each member of Congress is their CEO of their little congressional office, not the congressional district, but the office. So they have a DC office and, a, and House Representatives, you know, 10 people in the DC office, and they have one or a couple of district offices. And that's it, but they control that budget. The appropriators give them the money for their little congressional budget, and they can do pretty much whatever they want with it within realm. Um, Senate is similarly situated. The Senate gets larger budgets depending on the size of your state. Um, so the California budgets or Texas budgets are huge compared to Rhode Island and Delaware. Um, and then obviously the number of staff can uh, correlate to that. Um, but there is no tried and true guidance on the way these folks are supposed to operate in this new world. So let me stop there. Um, that was basically my general overview of, of how to network your way to a job, um, how to find out about the jobs um, and going forward. But I'd love to answer, stop talking and answer your guys specific questions. Great, thank you. So if you guys wanna start leaving questions uh, in the chat box, we can call on you and then have you pop on the screen and ask your question. Any of you guys, when you um, ask a question, just tell me your, uh, your situation briefly, like what year you are, what you're looking for, internship or job. Cool, okay, let's start with Zev Burton. Hi, first, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I am a rising junior in the School of Foreign Service studying international security and minoring in Russian math. And I was curious as to what is the best way to get that initial contact where you can start building your web off of? Do you go to LinkedIn? Are you just cold emailing a bunch of people hoping one responds? Or what's the best way to do that? The cold email LinkedIn route is possible. I'm not saying don't do it, you should try it. But uh, getting back to a little bit what I was saying earlier is that comic connection really helps. So Zev, where are you from originally? Uh, I am from a small town in Indiana. Indiana, okay. Um, and you're, are you, you're an undergrad at, at Georgetown? Yes, sir. So I'd, I'd reach out to, it, um, I don't know who does your federal affairs now, it used to be Scott Fleming. Um, I'd reach out to the person who lobbies for Georgetown on, on Capitol Hill and get a list of every Georgetown alum and start emailing them. Because if I'm sitting in my, my job and everyone thinks they're the busiest people in DC and I'm like hustling and I get this random cold email in my inbox, like, hey, do you have 10 minutes for a phone call or a Zoom? I'm so much more likely to do it if they share a common connection with me, as in Georgetown. Same thing on Indiana. And I don't know where you fall in the political spectrum, but I'd email Republicans and Democrats um, it, from Indiana just saying, you know, I, I'm from Indiana, from a small town in Indiana, name the town, obviously. Um, wondering if you have just 10 minutes. And uh, I'd say you're more likely to get somebody from Indiana in an Indiana office but with the tools out there today, like LinkedIn, you can probably find out people who are originally from Indiana. And again, that hometown, because keep in mind, everyone, from, everyone is from somewhere else, or if they're not, they're a local like me, they're proud of that being a local because there's so few of us, you know? And so, um, and, and keep in mind also, everyone has been in your shoes, including the chief of staff of the White House, including members of Congress who are interns themselves, like, Eric Swalwell and Tim Ryan and Paul Ryan, they were all Hill interns. Everyone has been in your shoes. And so there's this pay it forward mentality that if someone does get a cold email like that, they're 
they're likely to, to at least engage a little bit and to help you. But those common connections do help. So for example, I, I keep refer referencing ethnicity and, uh, and race or, or religion. So I am Greek American. Um, when I was unemployed for four months, I reached out to every Greek American I could find on Capitol Hill and in the private sector. Um, I, I went to Cornell and Hopkins. I emailed every, and even if I'm not a lawyer, um, even if they went to Cornell Law School, I still emailed them saying, hey, I went to undergrad. We're both, we both, you know, are Cornellians. You know, would you have five minutes for a quick conversation to give me some advice on this, this career I'm trying to explore? And those common connections are so much more likely. So at least start there. And then, like I said, building that web, at the end of each of those conversations, you're always going to ask for somebody else. And don't, don't uh, be specific to the type of connection that you want from that person. If you are certain that they reference somebody that they know that they want to put you in touch with, sure, mention it. But leave it open to them. Because like I said earlier, they might put you in connection with somebody who's at the State Department or on the Foreign Affairs Committee because they, they know that's that, what you're interested in and that's what they've heard from you. Or they'll put you in, some, some, in touch with somebody from Indiana to help you with that. So you just got to stay on top of finding those common connections and those common connections will lead to less common connections, but also to more conversations. Does that help? Yes, very much. And who, what was the name of that office you said at the beginning of your answer to reach out to, to find like all the people, all the Georgetown alums on Capitol Hill? Oh, um, there's a, um, there, you should, someone on this call will figure out uh, who lobbies f on behalf of Georgetown on Capitol Hill. It used to be, um, a guy by the name of Scott Fleming, but I think he's since retired. He, he was, came back at, at some point to do it temporarily, but there's some office at Georgetown that would have a list of probably all the Georgetown alum or your alumni association. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Mm -hmm. Happy to do it. Thank you. Um, okay, next we have uh, Paul Elliott Cormery. You wanna hop on and ask your question? Thank you, Paula. Uh, so thank you for your time, Tom. Uh, I just had a, a question regarding my current situation. I had an interview to join an office at Congress a month ago that was successful. Uh, I had the opportunity to join the team uh, during summer, but unfortunately what happened is that they follow up telling me that uh, unfortunately they couldn't uh, not uh, welcome us, uh, welcome me yet in the team because of the current situation. And they wanted to have a, uh, they just wanted to know if uh, there were a hiring freeze on Congress as of now. And so I tried to follow up asking if they had any new information about having new guidance uh, for hiring interns. And as you mentioned, there was this email that was uh, for uh, members of Congress and uh, legislative teams to hire interns. So I wanted to know if uh, there was maybe a, a possibility for me to find the document online and like follow uh, like follow up on them with that document or something? No, um, it's not online. Um, I, basically, just what it says is that as the committee, and this is the House of Representatives, so this is the sent out by um, the Democratic chairwoman and the and the Republican ranking member, so bipartisan, but just the House. Um, basically reminding them that, that they have an, an allowance of $25,000 per calendar year to hire interns, um, that the funds may be used for interns who work in district offices or remotely um, because of the pandemic. Um, obviously it's paying interns is still certified by the house um, and that house offices may use um, issued paid interns. They can issue paid interns house equipment. So laptops, tablets, mobile phones. Um, that is the guidance that I'm reading through. Um, it basically, basically what I was told was that until that guidance was given, a lot of them were holding back on whether they would even be able to send an intern, uh, uh, an official house computer or phone or tablet. Um, they weren't sure if they could use their money, their house budget to pay interns still in the, in the COVID world. So that green light has been given. But keep in mind, it's up to each individual office whether they do it or not. And like I said earlier, there are three different camps. It's the people that are going ahead with summer internships. There are those that are just punting till July to see what it's like then. And then some are just saying, all, all summer internships are canceled. We're just going to focus on the fall when things are more, we're more sure what's going to be happening. So when, when did you reach out to them? I'm sorry. Um, it was, uh, so I reached out to them at the beginning of the month. Uh, yeah, so this, this email was sent uh, like at the end of the first week of May. 
So they, they might not have received it. So I, I just follow back up. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. All right, thank you. And it looks like somebody actually posted the uh, current head of the Office of Federal Relations in the chat. So anybody who's looking uh, for that person, her name is Katie Button, uh, and there's a page linked in the chat. Well, I hope Katie doesn't hate me for suggesting, but she should have a list. <laughs> um, next up, we have a question from Daniel C. Hi, Tom. Um, th uh, thank you so much for doing this. I'm sure it is insanely busy with, with three kids. So. No problem. Um, so my question is, um, I'm subscribed to the, how or I should start off, I'm a first year grad student in the security studies program here at Georgetown, a uh, former DNC intern. Um, and I'm currently waiting to hear back from the National Security Subcommittee on the House Oversight and Reform. They keep telling me they have no idea what they're doing for their summer internship because they don't know when the House is gaveling back into session. Right. Um, which is very annoying. So thank you for at least informing us about the guidance. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, uh, in all the Senate and House jobs I've seen, um, for individual members, they call for either uh, Senate, uh, sorry, uh, state ties or district ties. Um, how strictly is that adhered to? And is it even worth applying for individual member offices um, that you're not from the same state or from their, from their district? Yeah, so answer your last question first. Yes, always worth it, fine. I worked for a California member uh, for nine years, um, although she is originally from Maryland like I am, but um, she represents San Francisco. I've been in San Francisco like twice before I started working for her. So it's, a, it, it's possible. Keep in mind things though, th politicians care about three things, re-election, re-election, and re-election. And in order to buttress those re-election chances, when they could say, oh, you know, I got Dan and Evie here from the hometown or home state or home county uh, working for me, you know, that helps show the, the district, show the voters that they're bringing the district to the DC and help them, you know, inform them the way they vote and legislate. So they're so much more likely to hire somebody because that helps in their mind their re-election changes, which it does. Um, but it's not, but DC staff um, can have uh, a different uh, background be from a different area. It does help a little your chances if you have some tie to the state or especially the district. So say if you have an aunt or an uncle or, or any relative that lives in that state, be sure to mention that in your application in your cover letter. Be sure to mention it in an interview that you have some tie to the district because that makes you a little more likely um, to be hired. Um, obviously, if you're from that district or state, you just scream it from the mountaintops and say it every, every sentence you can on the interview, in, during the interview process because that increases your chances. But be sure to apply to places where you're not from. That's totally fine. I'd say, I don't know if I had to put a number on it, more than half of the people in an office don't, are not from that specific district. Um, when a member of Congress is elected, which we'll get into in a second, um, so we, you're going to have a whole influx of people at the end of this year coming to town, uh, newly elected. They're a lot more likely to hire people from their, from their district or state, but in fact, those, a lot of those folks don't necessarily live in, live in D.C., so they're going to have to hire non-state people or, or, or uh, district people. Um, but the longer a member of Congress is here, the little bit more likely they're hired to hire people not from the home state or district, uh, if that helps at all. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, next let's go to Rhonda Craig. Hey, Tom, thank hey, you. Rhonda. Hey, this has been helpful. Um, question for you. I am, so I'm a graduating a student from the um, McCourt School of Public Policy, oh, graduating okay. this summer. Um, as I'm pivoting from working in journalism in my previous life to heading into the policy field, and while I'm specifically looking for press opportunities. I'm wondering if there are any drawbacks into just jumping into any kind of position just to get my foot in the door. Um, are you, do you have, like, are, have you been in school the whole time or did you do some professional work in between? Yeah, so I actually, an undergrad, I went to the University of Missouri. From there, I did reporting for like five, five years, five, six years. Oh, wow, um, and yeah. Then, yeah, I just went back to school for public policy. Got it. Yeah. Um, you're you're in a, in a different situation. I would suggest that you and did you, you were you a reporter yourself? Yes. Okay. So you you should be connect. You should be applying for press secretary communications director positions on the Hill for sure. Yeah. So when 
so say you're an undergrad and you go on a presidential can or I say congressional campaign this year and you're a press assistant, you're helping shuttle the press around and your press secretary communications director throws you a bone and lets you go on the record like once or twice. So you have that on the record experience that even qualifies to get a job as a press secretary comms director on the Hill, just because you have that on the record experience. So if that does, you are like overqualified almost in some respects because you know what the pitch is like and how it's interpreted from the other side, right? Exactly. So I think, I think you should have no problems um, getting a job in communications or uh, in press on the Hill. Very good, thank you. And although I will say oftentimes, and this includes lawyers too, people that go to law school, people that are kind of not mid-career but have some experience on their belt coming to the Hill, Sometimes they have to take a, a step down to go up, you know? So taking a press assistant job in the Senate or a deputy press secretary in the Senate, you should always apply for those. Um, do you apply for staff assistant? If it's like the perfect office, your dream member or senator, go for it. But in the interview say, oh, and by the way, I have five years experience. I'd love to help out the comms team. They might like it or they might not. You Sometimes you run into people who are younger or less experienced than you, higher up in the food chain, and they say no because they don't want you to leapfrog them. And that's just a dynamic that a lot of people uh, deal with, not only on the Hill, but everywhere. Um, but that's just it's gonna be cognizant of. Okay, good to know, appreciate that. Yeah, sure. All right, ne next we'll go to a question from Kenna. Hi, Mr. Manitas. Um, my name is Kenna. It's so nice to see you again. We met before at a games event a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, and you gave me amazing advice on how to edit my resume and reach out to people on the hills. I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, just wanted to let you know that I actually graduated last week, um, so I am now currently on the job search. Congratulations. Um, thank you so much. Um, I majored in culture and politics in the School of Foreign Service, and I also okay. had a minor in disability studies. And okay. My question to you was actually, um, given that, you know, you mentioned during your job search scenario, you had reached out to people on LinkedIn and asked them to recommend you to certain positions. I was wondering what the best way to go around doing that would be. Yeah, sure. So um, just, just to be clear, I think when you reach out to people on LinkedIn, it would be more of like, um, I'm looking for a job. I'd love some advice from you. I wouldn't um, off the bat, ask for recommendations. You need to establish that relationship first and get a feel for when you do that Zoom or coffee or in person or phone call, um, whether they're comfortable with doing that, giving you that recommendation. Um, and if they give you a favorable one, like if, if someone seems totally off put by you and you like you're bothering them, I wouldn't go back to them for recommendations. They probably won't give you a good one. Um, so I think that's, that's what I was referring to is, is utilizing LinkedIn to find those common connections um, and again, a common connection could be a, same, a similar interest in issue area. So you, you might not be from the same hometown or anything you know, in, in, in relation to that person or similar to that person, but you both love a certain subject area, reach out to them and say, you've achieved what I want to be someday. Like, would you have 10 minutes to talk? And that'll be flattering to that person. And like, yeah, you know, I, I was in your shoes one day, let's talk kind of thing. So I think you're utilizing LinkedIn for that purpose. Um, you can utilize Twitter and other forms of uh, social media and the internet to research people. I always just advise, and I'm an old man, I'm 40. I would not friend anyone on Facebook or, or Instagram. That's in my book, a step too far. Those seem like social platforms of like social being like actually friends or knowing people where a professional platform is obviously LinkedIn. It's 202 works. It's Twitter ish. Um, but I think you can do a lot of sleuthing without connecting with people. I, I think it's totally fine to connect with anyone and everyone on LinkedIn. That's like, like that's a safe ground for me. But I think other than that, um, to gather intel on common connections or, uh, people that you know, uh, in common, uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, reach for that connect button. Does that help? Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Good luck. All right, let's go to Vaishu next. Hi, Tom. Thanks so much for being here today and helping us out. I just wanted to say that your email is the first thing I check every day. So okay. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Awesome. And, um, also, it's weird. I think me and Kenna interned in the same committee last semester. So <laughs> hey, Kenna, too. Um, 
My question was just, I'm applying to entry level jobs since I've done the internship and I'm having a hard time picking a good writing sample from my internship. So I'm wondering if you had any um, advice for trimming that list. What types of jobs are you applying to? Just like staff assistants? Um, yeah, staff assistant jobs and um, legislative correspondent jobs because I have a healthcare policy intensive background. And um, that's also another thing it would be great if you could address. Everyone I know in healthcare policy obviously has their hands very full right now. So yeah. I don't really know whether I should bother them with anything right now. No, bothering them might be helping them. You never know. Um, you, they might be looking for an intern to like take a ton of, off their plate. Um, I tailor your resume and writing sample to the job you're applying to. So if your job, if the job description, make read carefully what the job description says. If it says you're replying to mail for the member of Congress as a legislative correspondent in the realm of agriculture, environment, and transportation, don't write about it. Don't give them a healthcare sa sample. Right? You know, mm -hmm. gear it towards that job, specific job description. Similarly, you're going to have a baseline resume that you're going to be doing, but you're going to highlight different things from your internship on the Hill, depending upon the job you're applying to and the description that it has. Um, and a couple of times that I've hired people, it's driven me nuts where I have put out there to the world exactly what I'm looking for. And in, in, in a resume or writing sample, they don't address any of that or any of that skill set that we've asked for. And I'm like, so what's the point? And they don't even get like considered because, and they might have that skill set, they might have that experience, but they didn't tell me in their initial transmittal to me. So how am I supposed to know? Um, that's super frustrating. So be sure you're tailoring it to um, to the job, both whether it's your writing sample or your resume. Does that help? Thank you so much. All right, great. And next we have a question from Jack Hogan. Yeah, hi. Thank you Tom, for being here. Um, so I'm a current junior at Georgetown under, or I guess I just finished my junior year, so rising senior. Um, and I'm someone who like thinks grad school might at some point be a route I wanna take, but I've heard for a long time, like, oh, it's good to get some working experience first, um, try out the real world, that sort of thing that helps you know what you wanna do in grad school, et cetera. Um, but to be honest, I'm kind of worried that I'm going to graduate in 12 months to a job market that like is still very bad. And so I'm wondering if you think that like looking more seriously at entering grad school straight out of college would be a better idea than it normally is, given um, that it's likely going to be a market with like less opportunities and more competition and then trying to get some more like intellectual experience and entering the job market in more formally in three, four years with a master's or that sort of thing? Great question. So let me pull on some experience that I had with some friends and colleagues. So uh, 2008 happens, Obama's about to get elected, the market crash happens, everyone coming out of school says, looks at the economy like, oh God, it's gonna be bad for a couple of years, I'm gonna go to grad school. The biggest group of unemployed people two and a half years later or three or four years later was people with law degrees without a job because everyone went to law school and it was crazy. You had like people with law degrees from very good schools or any, any school as it like answering the phones as an inch on the hill for, for over a year because the, the market was flush with people who had gone to law school because of the bad economy. So I just say that to say like, sure, are your chances of getting a job going to be harder? Yes. Um, does a postgraduate degree help? Yes. But in my experience, it has never helped at the entry level position. I am no more likely to hire somebody for a staff system because they have a lot of your master's degree. Um, am I more likely to hire that person at an upper level as a legislative director or legislative assistant or chief of staff because they have that degree? Yes. So it helps you, I feel like later in the political policy career path. Um, so I wouldn't say just because it's a tough market to deviate from it. Also, I think speaking from personal experience and other people that I know, I considered law school and I decided when I got my experience on the Hill that I didn't need a law degree, that I could just go get my graduate degree um, and, and not spend the time and money that it would cost to go to law school. Um, and a whole host of reasons. And other people have 
like gone into careers thinking that that was what they were going to do and then totally pivoted away. And if they had not gotten that real world experience, they might have sunk a bunch of money into a postgrad degree that wasn't relevant to what they had eventually ended up doing. So I'm a fan of giving a little bit of that real world experience first, especially if that's what you want to go do. Um, one thing I haven't touched upon that I want to get to at some point is campaign world. Like that is also a way to get a little bit of insight into what, if you think politics is for you and what you want to do, like go volunteer for whichever campaign you're, you're, you're cheering for in the presidential level or Senate or house. And again, this, this time is so difficult because in normal times you go knock doors, you could organize, do be a field organizer, or press assistant, and you get a, a real good taste of like, all right, do I want this campaign life or eventual politics life? as opposed to going to uh, grad school or law school. But in this new world, um, it's gonna be tougher. Um, what, real quick, specific to you, what do you think you'd wanna do in a year's time? What, what job would you be going for? Entry level on the Hill? Oh, you're muted, Jack. That's a great question. Um, I'm not totally sure. I <laughs> think I have entered on the Hill previously, and okay. I think I'd prefer to try something off the hill before I looked at like an entry level on the hill. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I try, I try for a, um, an internship off the hill at one of those organizations now, um, and see what, see what's what. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, Tom, did you want to take a moment and just speak more to um, students who are looking to get into campaigns during this time? I know we continue to receive a lot of inquiries about that. Yeah, sure. So I, um, before I was on the Hill, I did um, uh, did local campaign. I spent a summer on a um, Montgomery County executive race in Montgomery County, Maryland, county executive race. Uh, I then did a house race, just basic door knocking. And then I took a um, part of my semester or summer before my, as I was a rising senior, rising junior, I went to the Democratic Convention. I took two weeks, went to LA, stayed with family and friends I'd never met before, but I was like the young guy who knew to set up computers. And so I was literally setting up old school computers. And then two weeks later, by the beginning of the convention, I had earned the trust and, and worked my butt off because I would like get there, be the first one to get to work, be the last one to leave because I didn't know anyone in LA or, or have a car or anything. Um, uh, and I just worked my butt off. And so I was like driving around the Lieberman family. I was going to Donna Brazil and giving her a car and directions on how her and her assistant to get, get places. Like it was an incredible experience. And they convinced me to take a semester off from school and go to the Gore campaign headquarters in Nashville, Tennessee. And then if Gore had won, I would have been on the transition team and helping that. So, um, that campaign experience is incredible. And even though we didn't win, unfortunately, I learned a lot, but then also those people that I had that relationship with from the campaign, I'm still on text chains with. They are still the ones running Bloomberg's campaign and Biden's campaign. They're the old, old hands now because we're all old in the campaign and the political world. Um, I recruited my former boss from the Gore campaign to work with me as my colleague in Speaker Pelosi's office. So those relationships that you build on campaigns, you're... Um, when the in toughest times, if you're if you're in something tough with somebody, you you develop a bond that is stronger than a normal job, nine to five job. And campaigns are tough. Everyone works their butt off. They don't sleep. They don't eat. They eat unhealthy, and that establishes a bond that is higher and greater than any other type of experience professionally I've had in almost twenty years. Um, so I'd I'd encourage you all to go do campaigns. Um, it's going to be a weird one. This one upcoming. Um, but, uh, so I can't speak to what the, what in the world that's going to be like, or if those bonds are able to develop remotely, um, who knows what it's going to look like, but in a normal world, uh, campaign experience is incredible. Awesome. Okay. We just have a few more student questions. Emily Fisher, are you still on with us? Yes. Um, thank you for taking the time today. Um, so my name is Emily, and I'm a rising junior from West Virginia studying international law and my minoring in disability studies. Do you have any recommendations um, for how to kind of reestablish back with people you worked with during an internship or job that abruptly ended this semester um, because of the time all of a sudden you're gone and virtual things, everyone's kind of discontinued. So do you have any tips on how to help continue those relationships or reestablish them? Sure. Were you on the, in the House or Senate? I was in the Senate. 
send it? Yes. Yeah, so you know all their emails because it's the same ending of the email. So I just, or, or if you don't, you can, you can find them online for the most part. I just start sending them emails saying like, um, you know, loved working with you or didn't have a chance to work with you too much, uh, was looking forward to it. You know, would you have 10 minutes of the next couple of months to, to do a quick phone call with me? Um, and, and, I say, and I say phone call because even though a Zoom would be better, um, phone calls are easier. It's easier to like not be at your computer and be like chasing your kids around or doing something else and being on a phone call giving you advice. So I'd start with the phone call and I, in normal times, again, would never suggest that. I would always suggest pushing for a coffee because in-person is so much better. And I guess in, in between, between in-person and phone, a Zoom is better because you're looking at each other, uh, each other's faces. But again, because of the extra stresses on some people's schedules and lives right now, I, I just, I defer to a phone, um, especially if it's someone that you've already worked with uh, or been in the same office with. And I think you're going to get intel from those folks because you share that common connection of being in that same team, uh, even if it was for a couple of weeks or a month, um, that they're going to give you that advice. And just keep in mind, they are all in your shoes. They're all in your position at some point in their careers. And so they, they should be likely to help you out. Um, if they're not responsive, like just understand it's busy times. It's not nutty times right now. Um, but I would, if I put money on it, I bet over half of people get back to you um, with some type of correspondence. Thank you. Any, does that help, Emily? Yes, that does help. Thank you. All right. And next we have a question from Nathan. Hi, Tom. Uh, my name is Nathan Smith. I'm a recent graduate from the McCord School of Public Policy. I am uh, originally from Iowa um, and have a background in medical software technology, but I'm also transitioning uh, and want to focus more on U.S. foreign policy and national security. Um, I'm interested in jobs on the Hill and campaign jobs, um, just kind of casting a wide net and throwing my job application out there and seeing what fits. Um, but I'm curious, when I've looked at the uh, Senate and House job bulletin, it often just says like Midwest Democrat or Midwest Republican. Um, how do you narrow it down and figure out which office this actually is that's hiring yeah. so you can write better cover letters? <laughs> It's hard. Some some are not too clever and say Midwest, but but name the email like Indiana Nine at Gmail dot com. You're like, oh, Indiana Nine. That's you know the ninth congressional district. And you figure out which member of Congress that is. Or some are more slick and don't do that. When I am able to figure it out, I usually put it on my site to help inform people. Um, but yeah, oftentimes you don't know. So. Um, I would just beef up your Midwest ties uh, in your cover letter or in your resume if if you're not sure, um, because absent being from the same state, they're a little more likely to hire you if you do come from the same air part of the country. Um, but you know, other than asking people on the Hill who they might have heard they're looking for, so you said foreign policy. So say it says like Midwest Democrat looks for foreign policy legislative correspondent. If you've already done your work and you met with the Iowa offices, you've met with people who are legislative correspondents for foreign policy or LA, who's a foreign policy LA, and say, hey, I just saw this, any chance you know, and like, oh yeah, I know the person that just left that job, it's so-and-so's job, it's in this office. So just simply people within the same congressional delegation, uh, covering the same issue policy area, might know just because they've heard of someone leaving or someone looking for that position. Um, absent of that, uh, if they mention which member, if they say Midwest member serving on the Armed Services and, uh, I don't know, Veteran Affairs Committee, go look up which Midwest members are on those two committees and that might that might do it. So it's, it's a bit of research. It's a bit of like gossip and finding out what the word is uh, from people up there. Other than that, it's sometimes tough. All right. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that about does it for student questions. Um, Tom, I just have one question for you if we could leave off on this note. What is one piece of advice or one thing you wish that you knew when you were in college? Um, I'll, I'll use the piece of advice that I got that I think has helped me so much in politics and policy in this world that we, we work in, um, is it's hard work and attention to detail. So when you're entering an internship, someone said, you know, it's all about hard work and attention to detail. I said, well, how do you do that? Like, well, it's easy. 
find out when all the interns get there, show up 30 minutes early, and figure out when all the interns leave and stay 30 minutes later, and you will be known as the hardest working intern we've ever had. So in my first Hill uh, internship, I worked for Senator Paul Sarbanes. I was a communications major, so they put me in the comms office. I sat at the desk right next to the hallway as you go to the front office, and I'd be there like doing clips, and this is before like Twitter and all that stuff where I could do like research. But I was like literally cutting newspapers and putting them on papers and doing, and I do that morning, noon, and night, and the I would beat staff there, and I would stay later than some staff, and everyone leaving, they'd be leaving to go home. They're like, you are the hardest working intern we've ever had. And it was all because that stupid tip someone gave me. And I pass it along to people, and people have said the same thing, that they've received that. So when you're known as a hard worker, and you're getting paid nothing back then, and at least interns get paid something these days, that is, a, that is something that people seek out because no one's getting paid a lot of money in, on the Hill or in government. So they're looking for those hard workers who just naturally have that drive. Also, it's, it's, it's good that you're a hard worker, but the, the work product you're handing over to your boss better not have any flaws in it. So attention to detail is key. It's double, triple, quadruple checking your work. I don't care if you're the smartest kid who went to Georgetown. You better reread it 10 times and you better have your friend look at it. Just make sure there are no errors. Because whether it's a speech, and that senator member Congress is saying something, if that's incorrect, you're gone. And that was your 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 writing. Um, a lot of times when politicians are accused of plagiarism, it's the speechwriter's fault and not theirs. Um, and I know the bus, buck stops with the politician, but it's the staff uh, concern. Um, the other thing is, is even if it seems like a menial task, that if the senator wanted my press clippings and he liked the banner and the date, and if I, if I left off one of those dates, he's, he says, he yells at the press secretary, when the hell was this from? I don't know. And not the center of would have said that, but like that's an example. And that would have come back to me. So it's the hard work, but adding on the layer of attention to detail that whether it was as an intern and I was vacuuming the carpet better than anyone else vacuumed for Nancy Pelosi. And I stacked the fridge better than any other intern would stack in the fridge full of Coke, Diet Coke and Sprite. Um, that's what got me my inter my, from my internship to a job. They said, you were the hardest working intern we had. Um, why don't you come be our staff assistant? And that mix of advice um, has carried me through my career uh, to the jobs, kind of jobs I wanted. That's excellent. Thank you very much for sharing. Tom, we really appreciated having you today. Thanks for being so generous with your time and answering all these student questions. We really appreciate it. And let me, let me say, Paula, um, I normally give out my email and say I'm happy to get coffee with folks. But like I said at the top, um, it's just really stressful times with three kids and two, two jobs um, being at home. So when things get back to normal, I'd love to do coffees with you all. Um, my email is just my first initial and my last name at Gmail. So it's tmanitas at gmail.com. Um, but maybe we can do a follow-up Zoom or something at some point in the next couple months uh, as you guys progress. But this is my hobby. It's I'd love to do other than raising my kids and my wife. Um, I love helping people find jobs and, and navigating their career. So don't hesitate to reach out. I might punch you for a couple months in the current climate, but I'd love to help you eventually. Great. Thank you so much. We'll definitely do this again. All right. Thanks all. Good all luck. Right. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.